Hello. Welcome to the first edition of the Conference Pour les Brésil. And before. Um, Vivian, myself, Vivian, Vinicius, and Philippe Loritsen, we are the co founders of this conference. And on behalf of the organizing committee, we'd like to thank you for being here for this opening debate panel on foreign affairs and policy. This is uh, just to fulfill a question we've asked ourselves one year ago. We wanted to understand how we could improve the interest regarding Brazil in France, whether in the academia or away or outside the academia. But in, in order to answer this question, we proposed to answer this question. So, so when we were uh, we received uh, the support from Sciences Po, uh, the idea was to promote the exchange of ideas uh, among students, activists, and uh, public policy creators. And with this spirit, we decided to build this conference organized by us, uh, Sciences Po alumni, in order to try to overcome the inequalities uh, with 10 years away um, from the sustainable development, we decided to talk on, on inequalities because we believe that we, this, is a, it, this is a structural problem. And for this reason, we decided to talk about all of these uh, three uh, in 13 different themes to give solution to the problems of inequalities, which is the Agenda 2030, an international commitment uh, that uh, was accepted by Brazil and by other countries. Uh, so uh, the idea is to fulfill all of the objectives by 2030. We don't want to leave anyone behind. We are 10 years away from this and nothing we are building today would be possible without the relentless work of volunteers and all of these teams. 15 students, uh, they are all watching us right now. We, we also thank you. Uh, we thank Tid Setubo and the Political Observatory, Observatory of Latin America, Educa Libras, and the Headline Portal because they all helped us create this online event Everything is being translated into Portuguese and English and uh, Libras because we want to reach as many people as possible. And before we start the panel today, we'd like to use the opportunity to talk to you about the next event, which is going to be on the 27th of October at 3 p.m. local time and at 7 p.m. Paris time. We are going to talk on the democ on, on, about democracy and the overcoming of inequalities. We are going to have Governor Flavio Dino uh, the journalist, uh, Ms. Patricia Campos Mello, and uh, Gaspar de Estrada, and uh, Professor Tomás de Barros from Sciences Po is going to be the moderator. Conference Pour le Brasil is going to promote a uh, discussion on the challenges and opportunities for the cooperation of, gov of Brazilian uh, for local and global governance. We are going to talk on multilateralism and development and how to overcome inequalities and the Agenda 2030. Today, we are going to have the moderation of Professor Olivier Dabeni, and the debate is going to also have our former uh, foreign affairs ministers and former defense minister Celso Morin. Also, uh, uh, Director General from UNESCO, former Director General Irina Bokova, and also uh, Simone Sicchini. Uh, we all good afternoon uh, or good morning for those of you who are in Europe. We are 10 years away from the Sustainable Development Goals Achievement Deadline established in 2015. The 2030 agenda is an urgent call to action and an ambitious agenda for the promotion of peace and prosperity among all people and the planet. However, as we know, the integrality of this global agenda for development is at risk 
due to the slow and uneven progress made on the 17 goals and their 169 targets so far, particularly in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the effects of uh, the current situation, for instance, is what UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called generational catastrophe, the unprecedented education crisis emerging globally, which was described in the UNESCO policy paper, Education During COVID-19 and Beyond. In Latin America and the Caribbean, Brazil, as many other countries in the region, have committed to the 2030 Agenda and played an active role in designing it. While the region made significant achievements in the 2000s, reducing extreme poverty from 12% in 1990 to 46 in 2011, the proportion of people in extreme poverty has increased since 2015. And the current COVID-19 crisis is having a dramatic impact, driving millions back to poverty. Earlier this year, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, emphasized that we're living in a global crisis that requires global and regional solutions. There is an urgent need for improved multilateralism and greater global and regional cooperation to be able to overcome the enormous human, social, political, environmental, and economic impact that the pandemic is causing worldwide. The question is, and hopefully this panel will answer, how to proceed, how to proceed and in particular, given the shift of some major players such as Brazil or the United States who now oppose multilateralism, how can we promote new forms of collaboration? And another question will be the role of civil society. How can we trust civil society groups uh, to play an important role uh, in, this, uh, in the achievement of sustainable goals? In order to discuss these topics, we are very lucky to have an exceptional panel of distinguished guests. Mr. Celso Morin, Minister, former Foreign Minister of Brazil, twice in 1993-94 and 2003-2010, also former Defense Minister. Uh, Morin remains very active now in academic life and as a public figure, having written a number of books and articles on this ranging from foreign policy culture. One of his latest works, Acting Globally, Memoir of Brazil's Assertive Foreign Policy, was published by Hamilton Books with endorsements by Kofi Annan and Noam Chomsky. Amorin was a visiting fellow at Harvard Kennedy School in 2011 and 2015, and a distinguished fellow at King's College. He has participated in several think tanks, committees, and panels on themes of global interest. He was named as one of the uh, most influential foreign minister uh, by Time magazine. Then we'll have Irina Bokova, former director general of UNESCO between 2009 and 2017, and former minister of foreign affairs of her country, Bulgaria, between 96 and 97. This is Irina Bokova is a, uh, he's currently working as a professor at the Paris School of International Affairs here at Sciences Po. Previously, she also served as Bulgaria's ambassador to France and Monaco, and was Bulgaria's permanent delegate to UNESCO. Bukova was the first female and the first South Southeastern European to head UNESCO in history. And at UNESCO, Director General Bukova advocated for gender equality, improved education, and preventing fund funding for terrorism, especially by enforcing the protection of intellectual goods. And finally, we have uh, Mr. Simon Sekini. He is uh, in charge of Social Development Division at CEPAL in Santiago, Chile, currently also a member of the governing board of UNESCO's International Institute for Educational Planning. He's a member of the advisory group of uh, Social Protection and Human Rights Platform and member of the Advisory Council of Social Cohesion to the Government of Chile. His research and policy advice are characterized by a multidisciplinary approach and a focus on equality and human rights. Before we listen to uh, our guests, uh, I, I simply would like to congratulate uh, the organizers, all the full committee, 15 students, but uh, also in particular Vivian, Vinicius and Felipe, and uh, long live to the, this uh, uh, event. Hopefully it will become a yearly event uh, and, and we'll receive a full support from, from us at Sciences Po. 
So, uh, Minister Al Morin, the floor is yours, so to speak. Uh, okay, see if, uh, yes. Thank you. Is my mic on? Yes, 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 yes. Well, thank you, thank you very much. I want to thank all the organizers, my my fellow Brazilians who are there, but also the Sciences Po people. And of course, it's a great pleasure to be in such an important panel, and I, of course, especially pleased. Uh, to be here with Irina Bokova, uh, with whom I had the opportunity to cooperate intensively and extensively uh, when I was foreign minister. And I just have by chance to an image here, I don't know if it's possible to see, uh, because it's from Haiti. It's from Haiti, the image which we, uh, in which we work together. I'm there with some young, uh, some bo boys and girls in Haiti. But anyway, that's just a coincidence. It was there already. Uh, let me just say, uh, I'm very also pleased and actually grateful that you have this conference Pour le Brésil. Uh, I know it's an initiative by Brazilians, but others are participating. And I, if I would think in my very long uh, career and work, uh, I would never think of any a moment in which Brazil needed so much help. So Pour le Brésil is an appropriate title for, to, for having a, a conference in, in, in all fields. Uh, let me just make a comment on something because uh, we, we, it was, and I hope I can do all that in 10 minutes, I don't know. There was uh, uh, this reference to the title, the, uh, uh, which is multi, I mean, I say it in English, multilateralism and development, overcoming inequalities and the agenda 2030, the post-pandemic order. I see here at least topics for four different conferences. So it's very difficult to say, and I mean, you could very easily divide it into four, four at least. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to do it in, in, in a very concise way as much as I can. Uh, I'll, not, I'll not be mentioning too much data. Already the presentation here showed, and there are a lot of people, the other people here from Brazil and from other, um, of course, people who study Brazil that will make, give you precise uh, figures or inequality, poverty, and all these things. You have already presented some here in the, in the, in the, in the initial uh, slides. Well, let me just say one thing, because I try to, to put together all these four, uh, four different topics. And I, uh, in order to do that, I, I, I will mention that about two years ago, a little less than two years ago, I was invited by my good friend Juan Somavia to participate in the celebrations of the centennial of the ILO in Santiago. As you know, he was director general of ILO for a long, a long period. And I think this was a very interesting discussion there. There were very many distinguished speakers. I could think of several, but let me just mention, for instance, Alicia Barthelem was the uh, head of CEPAL, the Economic Commission for Latin America and Caribbean, and um, many others. And what, there wasn't a, dis a discussion about SDGs already, uh, although only four years after the adoption, but anyway, there was a discussion and the, di the difficulty to make progress uh, in, in the direction of getting, uh, to, to, to getting there, to, to, be, to, to obtain the SDGs as they were uh, mentioned. And I, I was, uh, uh, in a way, uh, of course, it was more focused on labor, but people spoke more generally. And I, I was a bit struck by the fact that most people who spoke uh, uh, did it in a way as if the problem was more or less a technical problem, an engineering problem. The question of having the people, uh, somehow this was mentioning, having the, what the government should do, what NGOs should do, uh, what diplomats should do, what ministers of economy should do, and all that's fine. Uh, I'm not saying that it was totally absent from political considerations, because of course the idea of political will was there. I mean, the idea at least, I mean, of determination, which is a political factor, of course. But, but I think even the politics of it somehow was technified, as if it was a question, well, let us show more political will, and then everything will go right. And I, I made a very blunt statement then, uh, 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 and I hope I was not impolite, but I think, I hope not, nobody said that, I don't, anyway. And I'll just repeat that, that here, and then I'll qualify it. Uh, when I, in that discussion, 
uh, I, 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 my, my impression was that the world in which the, the 2030 agenda, uh, in which the SDGs were approved, didn't exist anymore. Coming from a country governed by President Bolsonaro, after what had happened to Dilma and, and Lula, I mean, the kind of coup d'etat, lawfare, and so on, and seeing what the president of the most influential and the most powerful country in the world, how, they, how he acted, I think, well, this is no longer that we are in a different world. So a question is, before we can move back to, to see how we can attain these objectives, we have to change the world to some extent. So, and I was very pessimistic then. I was very pessimistic. I didn't see any signs that this uh, could happen. I must say that in the last two years, more or less, the 20 odd months that have uh, elapsed since that, uh, since that uh, event, I became, my pessimism, pessimism became a bit more nuanced. Not that the situation improved in so many countries. For certainly in Brazil, it, it, it was even worse and it, it's going, it's worse and worse every day. But I would say that I saw some positive signals. Maybe the most important one, in my opinion, actually, well, the first one that, that appeared very clearly came from Chile, precisely. Uh, other countries also in the world, I mean, I know this, in other countries in Latin America, in other countries in the Middle East, and in other parts of the world. But in Chile, uh, the, the pro which was always shown as a model of the neoliberal movement, the protests have been so overwhelming so total, which uh, makes it, in a way, you know, this was this old saying, I think it was by Karl Marx, that he would like to see not only the, uh, the, the weapon or the arms of the criticism or the weapons of criticism, but the criticism of the weapons. I don't, I don't take that. But what we saw in Chile was the criticism, not of all the academics, maybe the academics too, but it was the criticism of the streets. I mean, when we have a country, uh, middle level, upper middle level country, uh, about 20 million inhabitants, having 2 million people in protest. That's something fantastic. That's really, in a way, it's a revolution, I would say, in, a, in, the, in the best possible way. I mean, with the government working against and so on. And, uh, and, and you, we know we're going to have a pleb plebiscite, referendum, I don't know how to say it in English, tomorrow uh, uh, in Chile. And this is a very important thing. So this is one factor, because what I saw then was the new liberalism and the excessive globalization being criticized in the streets. And I think that was before the pandemic. Other things followed in other countries. And I mean, just trying to, to make a summary, I mean, uh, the evolution in Bolivia, for instance, we just had an election in Bolivia, which was impressive because about one year ago, there were accusations of fraud, which was totally unfounded, in my opinion, by the Organization of American States, because the problem that we have now to some extent, that always happened. I'm, no, I'm not a naive person, and I have lived quite, lived quite long. But I never saw this concept of post-truth, fake news, being applied so broadly, not only by governments, but by some international organizations, as it happened with the Organization of American States. So this is totally fine. And in spite of all that, in spite of the coup d'etat, we had an election last week in which uh, the the the, the Progressive Party, the movement for, towards socialism, and I like very much this title because it's not socialism, but it's, a, it's movement towards socialism, we had election by more than 20%, 25% uh, points of difference to the second. So I think this is an extraordinary fact. And of course, you take into account if that is also mean the, the empowerment of indigenous people and the reiteration of the confidence by the by 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 the Bolivian people in, in, the, in this movement. This is an extraordinary fact. And this happens together with other things, which, in my opinion, uh, uh, show that although it's still alive, the, the lawfare that, I, as I mentioned before, was responsible for the overthrow of President Dilma, uh, was almost almost compatriot by Irina Bukova, because their parents came from Bulgaria, as you know. But the overthrow of, of, uh, of Dilma and the imprisonment and the barring of uh, of President Lula from running an election. I think this is losing force. It's still alive, it's still on, but I see a recent decision in Bolivia itself, because we all fear that the elections would not even take place, but and they took place calmly and so on. In Ecuador, in which of course there were actions against President Correa, but there was the threat even of barring uh, the whole ticket and that was put aside. So I, I, this, is, this gives us 
some some hope that things are changing. Some of these things have uh, preceded the pandemic chronologically, and others, although they continued during the pandemic, it's not so much uh, not so much uh, 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 related to it as I, as I just uh, just mentioned. But I, I also would like to mention the the pandemic itself. Destructive as it was in Brazil, it's really almost 160,000 people already uh, killed by the pandemics. It, this, this is not only a natural tragedy, it's a social tragedy because and a political tragedy. But uh, I think, speaking more broadly, not only of Brazil, is that the pandemic somehow is going to highlight the importance of the public sphere, of the public goods in relation to private gain. I think this is really probably one of the biggest effects. It's very difficult to predict exactly how it will happen, but I think uh, I think it will happen. So I think we'll, we'll see an enlargement of the attention to, in, to the public sphere, to the needs of public goods, and in public goods, of course, global health is fundamental, environment and climate change is fundamental, uh, education is absolutely fundamental, and culture as well. So because I see also culture as a public good, not a private possession in spite of the people who collect paintings in, in their own houses and so on. So I see all that as, as positive changes. But of course, the forces of, 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 of the reactionary forces are still there. I mean, it, it suffice to listen to the speeches of Trump and Bolsonaro uh, in, in the last General Assembly to see that there's no place for solidarity. There is no place for humanistic values. And even the concept of freedom, which is or liberty, which is repeated by them, it's a totally false one. It's a, it's a totally distorted. It is freedom, freedom to kill, freedom to burn your forests, uh, freedom to disrespect human rights. And I think this is true not only in Brazil, but it's very much true in the United States because, and very clearly, what happened uh, 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 during the protests, uh, the racial protests, uh, makes it clear. And also. Uh, an astound, astounding uh, uh, st uh, number that I saw yesterday of the number of children uh, uh, of immigrants that remain separated from their parents. Um, I saw that yesterday in Le Monde, by the way. So I think it's really something that... The, but, you know, I, the election in Bolivia gave me hope. I don't know what will happen in the election in the United States. But the fact that this problem is being are being posed give me some some hope that things may improve. And all that, of course, comes together with an increased uh, attention to the problem of inequality. I mean, even people of the financial market now are speaking about inequality because they have seen that the inequality have attained such a level that it became dysfunctional for their for their own interest, for which interest, which after all is private gain. But anyway, uh, I see that. And of course, I just have to mention the initiative by Pope Francis about the economy of Francis and, and Clara. And I think this is something also that we have uh, to take in, into account. So I see, in a way, I see these positive movements. And in geopolitics also, I see positive movements. Not that I wish that the, the, the hegemony of the United States be replaced by hege hegemony of China, but I see movements that make the world a little bit more multipolar. And I can, and then I will come back to one of the subjects I mentioned already: inequality. I mentioned other things. I mentioned, mentioned Agenda 2030. Uh, but I'll, I'll now, I somehow, I'm mentioning now the post-pandemic order, and I want to mention the multilateralism because in order for multilateralism to be very, really effective, it must be based on something which we call multipolarity. It's not, it sounds similar, but it's not the same thing. Multilateralism. Basically, is the respect for the norms that have been agreed. Multipolarity, it's a kind of balance of power, very uh, speaking in a very superficial uh, uh, way. And, and, I, and I think to have a real multilateralism, not only in form, but also in content, you need some kind of multipolarity. I, I, know, I know the French know that better than any, anyone else. I always thought that multipolarité uh, was created by the French. Then I, I read that it was the Russians somehow who were the first but in my mind, it's, it has been the French that have been using it more, and Brazilians to, be, to a large extent. So everything that we did in foreign policy, like integration of South America, uh, BRICS, uh, IBSA Forum, with, and our relation with other parts of the world, had to do with this idea of multipolarity, which I shared among other people with my good friend Dominique de Villepin. So I, 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 I would just uh, 
uh, to close. I, I see these uh, these things as giving ground, uh, giving room to some limited optimism, and that's what I I want to see. And I I I think it's the mission of politicians not to complain. Well, sometimes they have to complain, but not keep on complaining. But see where the light comes from, even if it's just from a small part, and then you try to enlarge it. So our task is to enlarge it. And I see this ground for optimism. And then I would have, I mean, I, I would expand about the importance in our case of South American integration. I like very much the fact that your, your observatory is about Latin American and the Caribbean, because the Caribbean is very often forgotten in this, in this, uh, in this uh, context. But I'll give a final word about a subject which apparently is something else, but it's very much related because you can't have develop, uh, uh, can't have peace without development. We know that since, at least since the Pope uh, Pope uh, Paul VI said that. But even we know we must see also that we cannot have development without peace. And there is one aspect which has not been dealt with sufficient uh, emphasis, in my opinion, although some thinkers like Noam Chomsky, Richard Falk, and some others have emphasized it, which is the question of nuclear weapons. We give a lot of attention to climate change, and I agree totally. We give a lot of attention to inequality, and I agree totally. We give a lot of attention uh, to the generations of liberalization, and I agree totally, and to the financial capital. But we have also to have a look at nuclear weapons. And I must say, I even said that indirectly because I sent a message to him, to my good friend Guterres, who spoke that Two, in two recent speeches, excellent speeches, by the way, which I saw. One was directed to Latin America. The other was actually his opening speech, oh, the opening speech by Brazil, but I mean the pre-opening speech in the, in the United Nations when he referred to nuclear proliferation. I am totally in favor, of course, in avoiding proliferation, but I don't think you, this is enough. And actually, even non-proliferation will never be achieved if you don't have nuclear disarmament. So the total elimination of nuclear weapons is some, something absolutely necessary. And this is and the risk that we are seeing, if this rivalry between the United States and China increases, I don't, we don't know, depends a lot on the election, but depends on other factors as well, you know, very easily uh, can, can create an accident. And once the accident is created, then, then we are in the point of no return. So I think it's absolutely necessary to have in the global agenda, and this is crucial for development and crucial for dialogue, crucial for, for everything else, is the total elimination of nuclear weapons. I participated very time, some time ago with people like Michel Rocard and uh, um, Jacques Cousteau and Bob McNamara in, in, a, in an effort by and then the Australian government. Apparently, the successive Australian governments have taken it away from its site, which I don't understand why, but well, like, I understand why, but I don't want to mention but uh, something called the Canberra Commission for the Total Elimination of Nuclear Weapons. And uh, later on, we had in the United Nations the 13 steps. So it's, it's not only possible, it's feasible. But so I would like to put an emphasis on that aspect because it, it has been often forgotten. Thank you very much. And I, I think I went a little uh, uh, beyond my time, but not too much. Thank you. No, not too much, uh, Minister Amorin. And thank you for your limited optimism, however limited it might be, we take it, we need it in those days. Okay, so we will now listen to Irina Bukova. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it is uh, a little bit difficult to speak about my friend, uh, Celsia Omurim. I think we have to be quite a little bit to think uh, about uh, some of uh, uh, his thoughts. Uh, I'm very honored uh, to be with you here, Celsio, and uh, I would like to congratulate uh, the three students, uh, Vivian, uh, Phoenixius, and uh, Felipe, who is also my student uh, at uh, Sciences Po. I think this conference is very relevant uh, also because today is the United Nations Day, uh, and it's the right time uh, to speak about uh, multilateralism, uh, United Nations, uh, uh, sustainable development agenda, the Paris Climate Agreement, everything that uh, the United Nations brought, including uh, peace uh, and security and development. Uh, and in all this, of course, uh, the role of uh, Brazil uh, is, is very important, uh, being a founding uh, member of the United Nations, but also uh, having, uh, at least during my time in the preceding a, a very strong uh, partnership uh, with the United Nations system, uh, with UNESCO definitely, and uh, Celsius mentioned also 
two of my friends and colleagues, uh, former uh, Juan Somovia and Alicia Barcenas, uh, also with both of them, we developed uh, very, very strong partnerships. Uh, and I, I think it's uh, important also to speak, and it's important to, uh, in these uh, thoughts about uh, multilateralism, about the world, about the changing geopolitics, uh, uh, also uh, to mention the role of Brazil. And this was, I was, uh, I was trying a little bit to do the positive, the very important role uh, that uh, Brazil played uh, through the government, through the civil society, academia, uh, intellectuals, uh, I would say, uh, largely uh, into defining some of the concepts that uh, we have embraced today uh, within the United Nations system. Definitely, I speak about uh, sustainable development. I speak about uh, uh, the uh, several important uh, conferences uh, that um, Brazil staged, uh, the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in '92, which was the major, the first uh, such big uh, uh, gathering which uh, gave birth to so many of the policies and the institutions and the frameworks uh, of the, uh, of the uh, United Nations. Uh, one of the major outcomes, uh, for example, at the time was the uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, uh, the agreement that led further on to the uh, Kyoto Protocol, uh, the Convention on the Biological Diversity, where UNESCO also plays a very important role, the uh, desertification, and I would say the overall um, stage, the framework, institutional framework uh, uh, of the United Nations, including the uh, Commission on Sustainable Development. I think these were uh, very, very important, uh, 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 very important uh, uh, mi milestones uh, into the thinking about sustainable development. Uh, then, of course, were some other developments and we came in 2012 to the Rio Plus 20 conference and uh, uh, me personally, I, I participated then, and I know how much Brazil invested uh, into the success of this conference, where the major, uh, uh, once again, milestones of the future sustainable development agenda was uh, adopted. Um, I think it is important uh, to mention this because the uh, current success of the, of the SDGs, of this agenda, is also very much dependent on Brazil, a country which is rich, rich in... Uh, uh, ideas, as I said, um, intellectual uh, and other ideas uh, in academia, a society that is rich in natural resources, uh, uh, a country that has, uh, I would say, ups and downs in its own history of uh, social development, uh, uh, a country that uh, has uh, experience, a country uh, that uh, has influence also, not only in the region, but wider. And uh, that is why uh, I believe that such a debate about uh, the role of Brazil is so important. The role of Brazil, and I think um, uh, Celsius also uh, did mention it uh, wider when we speak about uh, uh, influence and responsibility. Uh, first and foremost, uh, maybe you could mention the, uh, all the peacekeeping operations of Brazil, because it's one of the countries, and this is where also we met uh, after the terrible uh, Haiti earthquake, and I know how much uh, Brazil um, helped Haiti overcome uh, these difficulties. But I would say on a wider uh, range, um, uh, Brazil uh, has shaped uh, in some areas um, a fundamental, a fundamentally new approaches to development. And I would just like to give one example because I give it uh, very often, not just in this conference, because this is a conference for Brazil, but taking the area of, uh, of education. The thinking about uh, education globally uh, within UNESCO, and I would say wider, is very much shaped by a Brazilian. This is about the educator uh, Paulo Freire. And, and this is really somebody that um, uh, has brought a different view uh, on education. And still, uh, we are following uh, this, probably one of the most influential philosophers of education in the 20th century. Uh, the way we shaped uh, goal number four in sustainable development uh, agenda. He was really the one who uh, launched the concept of popular education worldwide. And I think at those times it was quite a revolutionary concept, still very valid when we speak about the role uh, of education in the world. And also what is very important, he shifted the uh, understanding, the focus uh, of education, uh, from an ethical, critical, political 
uh, educational perspective. Uh, uh, and, and I think this is very much underlying also uh, the, current, uh, the current approach. And that is why it is not by chance, and I'm very happy that it was during my tenure as Director General of UNESCO that uh, the collection of uh, his works um, uh, were included uh, into the Memory of the World program uh, of UNESCO. And I think uh, this is uh, quite uh, uh, an important achievement because his view of the ethical side of education uh, for human rights, for uh, sustainable development, um, uh, uh, for uh, popular uh, education, for democratizing the education, for its role in social inclusion, uh, very much underpinned goal number four and uh, its target, I would say, rather target number seven, which is about global citizenship education. And of course, of course, that there will be a lot of talk further on. I saw on the program uh, about the role of education in difficulties, and I have been working a lot uh, uh, with the several ministers of education. I know the efforts uh, in terms of literacy. I know the uh, informal uh, education programs in order to reduce uh, the literacy. And I know that the uh, influence of, of education and the success on the declining rates of um, poverty uh, for a long time before... Uh, uh, 2015, the reducing of poverty were playing uh, a very, very important role. Uh, and uh, uh, once again, I would say that uh, if there is no further investment um, uh, in education and its quality, it will not, which is one of the biggest challenges, I think, of, uh, uh, of Brazil for its uh, competitive uh, economy, for its social inclusion. Uh, I think Brazil should indeed uh, look uh, strongly into the uh, increasing of the uh, education quality by expanding uh, early childhood development, uh, looking at um, inclusiveness. But something that is really important for the middle-income countries um, like Brazil with huge potential, it will look at the learning environments. It is not enough uh, just to um, create the uh, necessary spaces, but to look at the learning environments. And I think COVID-19 put with the very strong emphasis on exactly these learning environments when schools were closed uh, and um, education went digital. And we know that the access to uh, digital is limited in uh, some of these uh, communities and environments and it's uh, uh, expanded even further. And this is the big risk nowadays of further enlarging the uh, inequalities uh, if we do not create these learning spaces, these learning uh, environments. I'm not, uh, of course, uh, um, going back uh, to some of the programs that UNESCO was supporting, uh, like um, uh, Bolsa Familia for reducing the poverty and some of the others. But I would once again like to emphasize that um, for me, uh, the way out of uh, the crisis and to way out to reduce inequalities, which is not uh, as I said, the only way, but it is to massively uh, invest in uh, education, uh, in skills, uh, and create these important uh, learning environments. The second um, aspect that um, I would like uh, very much to uh, emphasize here, of course, uh, is the uh, role of uh, uh, Brazil uh, overall uh, into the uh, climate, the protection of biodiversity. Uh, and uh, I say this uh, because through the um, Men in Biosphere program at UNESCO, we have been working very closely with the scientific community, with the experts, uh, uh, in order to, uh, through the protection of these uh, biosphere reserves, which are seven in Brazil and covering, uh, I would say, a very large part of uh, this extraordinary uh, nature that uh, Brazil has. Um, it's uh, just to, to mention the seven, which is uh, Mata Atlantica, Sao Paulo City Greenbelt, um, it is Cerrado, it is Pantanal, Caatinga, Central Amazon, e Espina, es, Espinal uh, range. I think all of them are very emblematic uh, for, uh, for Brazil. And um, I was particularly happy to see that um, this type of uh, efforts for the protection of uh, biodiversity in the country, which unfortunately uh, is uh, currently subject to some pressures, uh, pressures of development, um, pressures of uh, uh, some uh, uh, economic rush for uh, economic profit. And we have seen uh, also what happened uh, last year, end of last year, with the devastating fires in the Amazon. 
uh, region. But this is very much linked also with the uh, maintaining of the cultural diversity. And this is my third point that uh, I would like uh, to mention here. Uh, Brazil is an incredibly uh, diverse country. And uh, for Brazil, uh, I believe um, culture and cultural diversity play also a hugely important role for the social inclusion and for, for overcoming uh, these big inequalities. Um, be it from the point of view of uh, systematic uh, racial discrimination that exists, be it because of the negligence of the uh, indigenous uh, communities. Uh, but I do believe that um, uh, this point of uh, diversity, of knowing uh, this diversity, of respecting it, is critical uh, to have the inclusion of the Brazilian society. And here I would like to mention one particular initiative uh, that um, we worked, and still UNESCO works uh, very closely with uh, Brazil. Uh, this is the uh, major, I would say, uh, mag magistral uh, project uh, that uh, UNESCO started already in the 60s. It's about the general history of Africa. And uh, I was happy that it was during my tenure that the ninth volume of this general history of Africa, which was about the African diaspora, was uh, worked with the uh, Scientific uh, Council, very much supported uh, uh, by uh, Brazil, by Brazilian scholars and others. And uh, one of the first uh, language, apart from the two official uh, uh, two languages of the uh, United Working Group, the United Nations and UNESCO was Brazilian and Portuguese that we presented in Brazil uh, on, uh, on a special occasion, because I, I do believe that uh, recognizing the value also of the African culture, the importance of its influence on the Brazilian uh, population and society, and also to look at how this diversity, this mixture of cultures can be used to uh, combat uh, racism is, uh, is critical. And I'm very happy, I just uh, uh, recently, uh, I, I looked at the last meeting of the uh, scientific uh, uh, board that is created to uh, look at the um, further uh, development of the general history of Africa. The next uh, volumes uh, uh, was uh, just held uh, last year in uh, Belo Horizonte, uh, supported once again by Brazil, by Brazilian scholars, because uh, I do believe that uh, it is of uh, a vital importance. And of course, uh, I can speak long uh, about the cultural heritage of Brazil, uh, the fact um, actually, this was one of my, my, my first visits uh, to Brazil in um, 2010. Uh, there was the World Heritage Committee meeting there. Uh, and uh, nowadays, uh, Brazil has 22 sites on the World Heritage List, quite uh, an important uh, sites which are cultural or mixed, uh, and uh, 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 seven of them are natural. And when I speak of diversity, and I would like... Um, uh, uh, to mention because Celsio Minister Celsio Amurim is here and uh, if he remembers also um, one of my first meetings with him uh, after Haiti was um, uh, during the Alliance of Civilization, a big Alliance of Civiliz Civilization, I think it was the third meeting um, in Rio de Janeiro and it was not by chance that once again Brazil convened uh, this uh, big meeting because one of the challenges uh, today that uh, we are, uh, uh, we are confronting and probably uh, with this uh, changing geopolitics, with the pressure on multilateralism, with the uh, movement uh, towards um, uh, closure, uh, towards unilateralism, with the rising populist movements and nationalist movements, uh, I think the problems of, uh, of living together uh, come once again with all its force in this uh, uh, very diverse world. And, uh, uh, I do remember the huge role uh, that uh, Brazil played uh, in this, and it was also part of the, I believe it was the initiative once again of uh, uh, Celsius, Celsius Murim, uh, because it was uh, indeed a very successful conference. I mentioned uh, all these issues uh, because I do believe that uh, uh, there is a deeply, uh, I would say, uh, founded tradition in Brazil to be, to be multilateral. It is... Uh, uh, within the uh, academia, the civil society, uh, which is uh, uh, about the expert community and others. And uh, uh, when I look at the world, and uh, we are speaking now about the devastating consequences of uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, there are, uh, of course, uh, uh, huge worries, uh, which are mostly linked with the 
uh, increasing inequalities in the world uh, largely. And I'm, I'm deeply concerned about it. I'm deeply concerned that uh, uh, after the financial crisis in 2008-9, we have not learned the lesson. Uh, at the same time, um, like Celsius, I would like, I would prefer to be probably kind of a realistic optimist uh, because what strikes me enormously now nowadays is that um, there is definitely a huge movement uh, all around the world to put the human development, the human security into the center of policies. Um, to say, uh, be it in the private sector, that uh, the uh, profit is not only uh, the purpose uh, of, of, of economy, of the business, that if you do not invest uh, into health, uh, into education, uh, if you do not make safe, because nowadays with COVID nobody is safe, uh, is, is still in whatever country in the world we have, we have this uh, pandemic. I think there is a, a, an overall rejection of this model of neoliberalism uh, that uh, brought about the crisis and that made globalization uh, increasing sometimes the inequalities, lifting people out of poverty in many parts of the world, no doubt, but also leaving outside um, millions of them. Uh, and, uh, and that is why uh, I think that now is the time indeed uh, to say that progress does not have a meaning if it does not serve the people, if we really do not look at those who are the defining uh, purposes uh, of, of a society, uh, of education, of health, of decent jobs, of environment, of climate nowadays, because we are very much uh, dependent on that. And this is where Brazil's role is so important. And I hope that some of the answers and uh, some of the ideas may come out of this conference. So thank you once again for inviting me and I'm very much looking forward to following the debate further on. And very nice to see Celsius Murim here once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We, we are going from limited optimism to realistic optimism. So this is reassuring in those times of pandemia. Uh, Simon Sachin, yes, this is your turn. Thank you, Professor Daben, and it is uh, really a pleasure to share uh, this panel with uh, distinguished leaders like uh, Celso Morim and Irina Bokova. And also, thanks a lot to Vinicius, to Felipe, and to Vivian for the invitation to discuss and share ideas right on uh, on UN Days. I work at the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Our Executive Secretary. Alicia Barsena sends uh, the best regards. I will uh, focus my intervention on a, an analysis of, of a, more from a regional perspective, obviously, obviously talking about Brazil, and yes, putting some data and statistics uh, on the table because that's what uh, much of what we do at the, at the Economic Commission for Latin America. Now, it is obvious that uh, we're going through very difficult times, right? And when we look at the title of, of the conference, uh, multi multilateralism, development, inequalities, the signs are, are, are not good on those grounds. Uh, multilateralism is, a, is a, in crisis. We need to look at reality, face reality. Uh, the U.S. got out of the... Paris Climate Agreement is getting out of the WHO. Even in the region, uh, there is not much of a unified regional bloc. Even at the sub-regional level in Latin America, there are tensions, saying Mercosur, between uh, Brazil and Argentina. So complications there. Development, I will give you some numbers, but obviously uh, because of uh, the previous crisis, because the region was not doing very well before the pandemic, but also and mostly because of the pandemic, we're seeing a certain setback in the uh, millennium, in the sustainable development goals. And obviously, inequalities are, are high and uh, growing. Uh, if you look at the data we published each year in the social panorama of Latin America, well, last year we showed that Brazil indeed went back to having the, the highest Gini coefficient, 0 0.54 in Latin America, right? And also because of the crisis, we we think that that, uh, le that level of uh, income inequality will go up by about 5 to 6 uh, percent. Obviously, there are not only in Latin America and Brazil uh, income inequalities. We need to also always 
discuss the multiple dimensions of what we call the matrix of social inequality. So we need to look also at gender, at age, at race, ethnicity, territory, uh, migratory status, and, and also disability. And I congratulate uh, the students for having a, a translator today. Thanks a lot. And uh, these multiple inequalities are connected to what we call uh, a culture of privilege that is so strong all over Latin America and, and in Brazil as well. A, a culture that takes differences uh, between people and naturalizes them and then uh, uh, makes it uh, unjust, right? And the, this is rooted in the history of Brazil and the history of the region. Then comes the pandemic comes the pandemic and the, the consequences obviously are dramatic, but it is also a catalyst, a possible catalyst for change, for positive change, for courageous change, for transformative change. Uh, it is indeed when uh, at, at times of this crisis when the structural problems, they come out, they become more evident, and when the policy debate opens up, uh, ideas and proposals that seem very heterodox all of a sudden become to taken more uh, seriously. Uh, as you know, the headquarters of the ECLAC, and I'm uh, talking from Chile, Chile because of the protests. Now we tomorrow we are having a, a referendum to change the constitution. And until not long ago, in the policy area, we were discussing a 0.1 percent of the budget of very limited policy debate now the policy debate has has opened up and this is also why it is important to have this conference and to uh, discuss among us obviously there is also a risk to go back to uh, old style austerity policies that have proven uh, disastrous disastrous in, in latin america and we need to make sure to avoid uh, those kind of, uh, of policies. Um, next week, starting Monday, uh, there is a very important uh, meeting uh, in Latin America, the period of session of the ECLAC. It's our biannual meetings with all the governments of the region. And there we will present a document, a report titled uh, Building uh, a New Future a transformative recovery with equality and sustainability. Thus, we do a diagnosis of the challenges of the region, but also we propose several policies to, to, to overcome uh, those challenges. It is obviously difficult right now to talk about post-pandemia. We are still in the middle of it. Actually, we see uh, in Europe, unfortunately, a, a second wave. In Latin America and in Brazil, it is important to say that the impact of the pandemic is deeply intertwined with the structural problems of poverty, of inequality, of informality, and of lack of social protection. Let's think about uh, the informal workers who cannot do telework, the children who cannot do uh, study uh, online. Let's think about uh, overcrowding in, uh, in, the, in the dwelling or high density in, in slums. And these are uh, characteristics of Brazil and of the region that, that explain the speed of the uh, contagion and, and the uh, results that we saw. Unfortunately, uh, in Latin America, we have five of the 10 countries with the highest accumulated number of uh, coronavirus, coronavirus cases. And Brazil is uh, third in the world with more than 5 million cases. And also we have five of the 10 countries in Latin America with the highest death rate because of coronavirus. And there also uh, Brazil is sixth with a mortality of about 730 per million inhabitant. Just as a comparison, France has a, a rate of 520. And also because of this pandemic, we forecast at the ECLAC that the, uh, we will have a biggest contraction in economic terms of the last 120 years. Uh, this year we forecast minus 9.1% of GDP growth, <laughs> a recession. And uh, Brazil more or less is the same. We forecast minus 9.2%. Obviously, this means massive loss of uh, employment. Uh, in Latin America, we forecast to reach 13.5% of unemployment. And in Brazil, even worse. We, we forecast 
uh, 18% rate of unemployment. Plus, the rate of unemployment doesn't tell everything because many people are just getting out of the uh, labor market. Unfortunately, we're also forecasting high uh, increases in poverty rates. In Latin America, we increase, we, we forecast an increase of about seven percentage points to, to 37%, which means 45 million people falling into poverty, reaching a total of 213 million people. And in Brazil, more or less, uh, we see a same increase of a 7.7 percentage point and uh, more than uh, one fourth of Brazilians, 26.9%, uh, are forecast to, to live in poverty. And uh, of those, one of 10 Brazilians are forecast to live in extreme poverty, something on which Brazil had made massive uh, uh, progress. And now we see uh, going back to, to, to data we hadn't seen for a long time. However, however, I must say that these forecasts do not take into account policy measures that have been taken uh, in the, by the countries of the region, including Brazil, especially cash transfers that uh, have been implemented to guarantee basic needs and the basic level of consumption, especially by, not only by the poor, those who were already poor, but also by these big informers. So I must say it is important that some measures like the, the auxilio emergencial in Brazil have been taken, these, uh, these uh, a cash transfer of about $114 for uh, nine months to basically informal workers. And also some uh, some national governments, Sao Paulo just said it's going to do a, a three-month emergency basic income. So this shows in a way that also in a huge crisis like this, the role of the, of the state is being re-evaluated re uh, in a positive way. I mean, uh, obviously the state does not have to do everything, it has a, a central role in development. And at the ECLAC for the region, we have proposed both uh, measures for the short term, emergency measures and emergency basic income, uh, hunger grants, a package to universalize broadband access, also uh, ensuring co-financing of, of uh, firms, payrolls, Etc. But also we're thinking of the obviously of the exit, right? Of the big question, the medium and the long term. How do do we promote sustainable development? How do we build a, a, a better future? And there, obviously, we are thinking of uh, new sectors that need to be strengthened: non-conventional uh, renewable energies, electromobility, the digital economy, the healthcare sector, tourism. When it can. We, when we go back to that, by economy and the circular uh, economy. And in the social sphere, I must stress that in, in Latin America last year, uh, a regional agenda was approved. It's called the Regional Agenda for Inclusive Social Development. It, it was approved by all governments, include, including uh, Brazil. And this is a technical but also political instrument to promote the social pillar of Agenda 2030. And based on human rights, it proposes mainly four things. One, universal social protection systems. Two, social and labor inclusion. Three, strengthening the social institutions. And four, regional cooperation and integration. Thus, my final message is that uh, although the crisis is uh, Agenda 2030 is uh, more important than ever, and especially the big message of leaving no one behind is so important for Brazil, is so important for Latin America. And uh, to close with respect to pessimism or optimism, I will cite Antonio Gramsci, who always talked about the pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of the will. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we've been kind of uh, reasonable, so it's uh, 4.05 and uh, I have questions for you. So I'll, I'll ask each uh, one of you a question and, and ask you then to allow you to answer in five minutes each, something like that, so that we can keep in time. So um, let me start with uh, Minister Amorin. Question is, uh, what countries in Latin America could become important strategic partners in political and economic terms in the years to come? Okay. 
Uh, I have a, a question for, uh, for Irina is the following. What is the role of international organizations in the current context regarding specifically fake news and the lack of trust in science and in the institutions? The UN has the verified campaign against disinformation, for example. Do you think initiatives like that can be effective to help people get well informed and trustful? And a question, uh, a question for, for you, uh, Simone. Um, the global pandemic seems to lead to more protectionism to each country trying to defend local employment. Even before COVID, controversial positions of Bolsonaro's government have reduced international investment in Brazil. Is it possible to overcome inequalities in a more protectionist world? So those are very interesting questions. I, I thank the people who asked them. So I'll give you five minutes, five minutes each. Those are pretty large questions, but then uh, we are limited with no. Uh, Minister Amorin. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and I was, of course, very glad to listen to the two speakers and of course, particularly to Irina and all the things that she said about Brazil. Irina, I'm afraid now we are living in a different country. Uh, for some time. The country is the same, but the way the government goes is totally in, the, in an opposite direction. And uh, as I said, it's a kind of a nightmare. And the one thing that, uh, the only thing positive that you can say about a nightmare is that when it's too strong, the, your organism reacts and you wake up. This will ha happen rather soon. Uh, in all fields, I mean, let us mention this uh, health since it's so so important and so so present day, so much discussed in present day, Brazil has been always a leader in the question of allowing access to medicines, and not only the government of Lula, and I'm not only speaking of that, of course, in which it was very active, but also in previous governments. When I was ambassador, I worked together with the minister of, of Cardoso uh, to guarantee the famous, it's part actually, since we're speaking of the SDGs, if you go to SDG number three, uh, about health, you'll see that it mentions respecting the flexibilities of the of the Doha Declaration on trips and health. This is an absolutely important uh, point that Brazil was able, Brazil le led. I can say you without any false modesty that we led the effort to discuss uh, this question in you know, at the time of the launching of the Doha Round. So I think this is one example, but I could mention others. Coming back to the specific question. Uh, uh, well, uh, it's difficult to say who can be more a strategic partner. I think Brazil has, of course, a strategic role for all reasons. I mean, if you think especially of South America, Brazil is half of the GDP, more or less half of the GDP, half of the population, and half of the, the, the land mass. Uh, we have borders with 10 countries. And uh, the only two countries that we don't have borders is Ecuador and Chile. We have excellent, have always historically had excellent relations with them. And the most astonishing thing, if you say, because that if you compare uh, worldwide, and I mean, being in Europe, you'll, you'll know what I'm say, talking about. I don't know of any other country that has 10, uh, 10, border, uh, 10 their borders with 10 other countries and that has had not a war with any of them in the last 150 years. So this is a really culture of peace, since you were speaking of UNESCO here uh, also, uh, which Brazil somehow represents. I remember reading the book by a Austrian author, uh, very famous, became, well, he's very famous worldwide, but famous in Brazil as well, because he died in Brazil, Stefan Zweig, and which he said, uh, in which he said, it's the only country in the world that he had been, in which the national heroes were not the generals or someone like that, but a diplomat. Um, uh, the famous Rio Branco, which is the name of our uh, diplomatic academy. So these are the th things that make Brazil naturally, apart from all the, I would say, marvelous cultural mixture, although racism is still a very serious problem in Brazil. I don't want to diminish that. But anyway, many things are being done to overcome that. So Brazil is necessarily a strategic partnership. Uh, 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 and all the others, I mean, in different ways. I mean, uh, of course, Argentina is for us the main partner because the rivalry that existed in the past was something that prevented the integration of South America more, 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 uh, more broadly. But Chile, uh, with all, uh, Chile has a big role in uh, with new ideas, bringing 
uh, not only new ideas, but also uh, some kind of, in spite of what happens internally, Chile has some sort of rationality in its foreign policy that is very helpful in all the process. It would be too long to go into that. So it's, I cannot elect one country with whom I would like to have. Uh, uh, I think the first need is Brazil to improve. I don't think it's possible to think of integration of South America without Brazil. It's, it's a fact of life. But I hope it could be done because it would be a good example. But it, it's very difficult. Uh, and I, I mean, Brazil is a member of BRICS. Brazil is a member of, if you think, if you think in terms of, let us say, big geopolitics, Brazil is a member of BRICS. If you think about climate change, Brazil is a member of BASIC. If you think about the countries that have been to, to the Security Council, Brazil is one of the non-permanent members that has been more often then. So it's very difficult to say if you take the WTO negotiations on trade, Brazil was there with India, uh, European Union, and the United States as the main negotiators before China rose the way it rose. But anyway, that was it. So it's very difficult to think Brazil is the country that's the most, that has the biggest African population, not only out of Africa, but it's second only Nigeria. So all these things make Brazil what it is. And unfortunately, we're having a government that denies all that that denies multilateralism, that denies uh, the benefits of, of, of multilateralism, which denies, to a large extent, uh, in practice, if not maybe in words, sometimes even in words, it's African past. Uh, so uh, this is what has to be changed may, mainly, mainly, I think. And I think uh, uh, we, I'm very encouraged by this, the changes that have been taking place in South America in the last two years or so, the election of uh, Alberto Fernandez in Chile, the fantastic election of the candidate of, of uh, Lucho Arce in, in Bolivia, the, the referendum in Chile, which I think will have a good result anyway. Maybe it's a, it, it has two possibilities, because an excellent result or a, or a very good result. So I hope it will have an excellent result. But I, I don't want to go into to internal politics in Chile. But anyway, so we are moving in that direction demonstration and protests in Colombia, which for the first time take the shape that they are. And of course, we have a progressive government in Mexico. It's very difficult for Mexico having such a large border with the United States, of course, and having the natural attraction of the United States. And I, I, I was, I mean, this is a general, and of course, there is a big influence in the region also of what happens in the United States. And I'll finish with that uh, comment. Although there is also an influence of the region in the United States, Obama, when he decided to recognize Cuba and to establish relations with Cuba, said it could not be isolated in its continent. So its reciprocal influence, of course, the United States is much bigger and much stronger. So I just finish with one thought. When Trump was elected, I was interviewed by a Brazilian magazine, Carta Capital, asking me uh, what uh, I was in Europe, by the way. Uh, 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 asking me uh, uh, what did I think about Trump. But I think they, they were mainly concerned uh, well, the effects of Trump election. And they were mo mostly uh, concerned, I believe, with uh, protectionism in areas like steel, uh, I mean, commercial and economic questions, basically. And I said, well, all these things that may be true, but the worst thing about Trump is the bad example. Is the bad example. I don't think an election of Biden will make a structural change in the United States from a moment to another, it's a very difficult thing to happen. But but the fact that, that human rights are taken seriously, that climate change is taken seriously, that uh, multilateralism is taken seriously, even although I don't agree with the uh, definition that the United States often gives to multilateralism, because they include NATO, for instance. Well, NATO is not multilateral. NATO is, is something to do if it's a defense agreement. But anyway, but I think if there is a different disposition, quite apart from the effect that it will have in, in world geopolitics, it will be a good example for Latin America as well. So it will increase the possibility of, of, of more governments uh, being uh, going into the right direction, having, having agreements and having a strategic, a strategic partnership. Of course, if I speak as a Brazilian and I have, say, one strategic partnership for Brazil, it has to be Argentina. There's no doubt about that, but all the other countries are important as well. Thank you. Thank you, Celso. Irina. Sound, sound, sound. We can't hear you. Your microphone. Yes, now I put it, yeah. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, thank I you. wish you have asked me an easier question uh, because I believe the question about uh, what can be done nowadays uh, about the fake news uh, and about mistrust uh, is one of the biggest questions uh, actually that we have in practically all societies. Um, and of course, uh, there are very many different reasons for that. Uh, that uh, the fact that uh, people are disenfranchised and uh, people do not trust um, uh, their uh, politicians uh, in the first place. Um, there is a lot of uh, manipulation because of the, uh, I would say, uh, bad quality of education sometimes, a lot of ignorance uh, that is there. Uh, and there is, of course, the deliberate uh, use of uh, this type of uh, manipulation for a very narrow uh, political purposes. But um, when, when we speak about that, of course, we speak about social networks, uh, we speak about uh, the new technologies uh, that are um, having an incredibly, I would say, uh, positive impact overall on, on all of us. We are connected, uh, uh, we, we can solve the problems uh, with this, but at the same time, it changes uh, the relations uh, sometimes among each other. Uh, and um, the big question uh, nowadays, in my mind, uh, is whether uh, it is um, possible to introduce some, some rules uh, like we have in uh, all the other uh, relations, uh, some kind of, a, of a rules for, uh, uh, um, particularly when we speak about uh, young people. I know one of the biggest problems is to um, give the right uh, guidance uh, to young people when they uh, use uh, internet uh, because um, uh, a young uh, a child goes into this uh, totally open world um, sometimes centers without any guidance so I think it's very important to have some value value system that uh, that guides us uh, into this and as to the role of the um, international organizations um, well, uh, I think it's uh, on one side, of course, this is a big platform to discuss these issues. And I know this because the UNESCO has the, uh, in the mandate, has the responsibility to uphold the freedom of expression. And uh, UNESCO works a lot uh, uh, with the media uh, in, this, uh, in this particular area. Uh, but on the other side, uh, also, uh, it is about... Uh, uh, science and I think there are two two aspects here. It's science and education. Uh, in education systems, you have to create the right values. You have to have an enlightened. You have to have a really an educated citizens in order for them to make the right judgments. I think this is the idea of global citizenship education, the target number seven of the uh, goal number four, uh, which is exactly about. Uh, what kind of citizens we want that young people come out of a school so that they really uh, have all the responsibility for themselves uh, to make their own judgments. Um, uh, and the other, of course, is the a big role, and you ask also this question about the science. Now, um, I'm, I'm worried that uh, indeed in this process, and we are seeing a lot of uh, uh, mistrust, a lot of attacks even sometimes, uh, uh, on science, which uh, might seem to be uh, totally um, uh, outside the context of the uh, 21st century, but this is uh, uh, what is happening. Uh, and that is why uh, I think there is a new, there should be a new way of um, interface uh, between science and policy. Actually, already after Rio Plus 20, there was a uh, a report uh, presented there by, by leaders commissioned by the then Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi uh, uh, Ban Ki-moon, and there were three paragraphs that were related to science, rather to science policy interface. And on that basis, um, Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General, asked me to create a, uh, a structure, create a scientific advisory board to, to look at this link between interface between science and policy. I think still there is a lot of work to be done there. Uh, there is a, a lot of necessity. Uh, I would say a lot of uh, need for on one side political will uh, for this uh, to happen. Uh, and I see a lot of mobilization of all different kind of leaders, um, uh, religious leaders, including look at the last, uh, last but one uh, encyclica of Pope Francis uh, Laudato Si on the climate. and. Uh, he was very, very much also citing and quoting the 
uh, scientific data that were um, presented that exist there uh, to testify that there is climate change. And I think this is a, a true leadership uh, when we speak about uh, something that is vital uh, for humanity. On the other side, um, I think the scientists themselves also have certain responsibility. They should, um, uh, they should uh, know how to talk to the public. At the end of the day, uh, science, uh, higher education, research uh, has a prime responsibility. They should serve society. And I think they also have to make an effort uh, in order to uh, be an advocate uh, for the science, in order to be uh, in a normal, uh, the people's language, in order to liaise and to explain to them. Uh, so it's a complex issue. It's a very complex issue. And I'm afraid that um, sometimes uh, social networks exacerbate this fragmentation and this uh, mistrust. Um, either towards uh, politicians, towards scientists and others, but uh, without having, uh, I would say, a strong uh, educated citizens, uh, probably we will not solve this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Simone? Well, thanks for the other very easy question, right? <laughs> no, um, first of all, uh, one thing is we need always to, to have in mind is what we mean by inequality and how we measure it because it's really a kind of uh, complicated, right? There is within country inequality, there is between country inequality, and also when we look at inequality within a country, say Brazil, generally, and the data I cited is based on household service, the famous Gini coefficient, but that is only part of the inequality we can explain because we know that the super rich, the top 1%, top 0.1%, their incomes are not seen in those household service. So that's why we also need to look at wealth. So that's why when we say uh, inequality is increasing, then in, that, in those terms, we uh, need to include in the picture the, the, the top 1%, top 0.1%, and it is very connected to the issue of financialization, right? That we're not just looking at the real economy, what, how much we are producing, but also at all the investments and the stock markets and the financial products that make, made it possible that we're going to show it in this report I cited, we're going to present next week, that over the course of the last about 15 years, basically only the top 1% grew in absolute terms, their incomes very highly, even up to $25,000 per year. It's crazy, you know, when, when you look at that. So going back for a second to labor incomes, obviously, that explains much of the traditional inequality we show. There is this great heterogeneity in the production structure, these globalized companies that in Brazil and in Latin America, they don't, they hire a, a minority of, of our workers and the great majority is informal workers. And then that inequality in labor incomes that explains about 80% of household incomes transmits to society. Eh? And then we have this high Gini coefficient. And obviously, Historically, in the, in the last years, it is connected, uh, the, the level of inequality is connected to different things. For instance, uh, the role of technology and the, the great growth of uh, China and the fact that many countries have seen the industrialization has created in the world, at the world level uh, certain loss for the middle classes. No, the, the, the poverty was reduced in the, in the last decades, but uh, inequality it is, uh, went up and the middle classes lost out a little bit. So when we see uh, calls for pr protectionist measures, obviously they, they need to consider the complexities because when you say, uh, like in the US, you protect uh, steel, Okay, you protect the steel industry and the few workers in the steel industry, but all the other companies that need steel at a reasonable price to produce cars or other products are hit. So, uh, in, in a world that is globalized, where we have glo value, uh, global value chains, 
it is important to really assess what are our strengths and the sector we want to strengthen. It is time, it is time to discuss again industrial policy. A country like Brazil is big and it has a chance, you know, to their industrial policy. It has a huge market. Uh, they can take decisions that make sense for the economy, but you cannot isolate yourself. And uh, the, the, the impacts on, on inequality can be, uh, can be can quite complex because it is a matter also of growing, not just, uh, we don't want to be poorer and, and more equal. We want to be uh, less poor and uh, more equal. So I don't have, as you, as you noticed from my answer, I don't have a, a, a definite answer, but really we should be um, wary of uh, excess of uh, protectionism. We should strengthen, especially regional cooperation. Nowadays, we see that all countries, they want to go on their own, but that is not the way out. And that's, that's why we need to make a strong call for uh, more multilateralism in, in the economic sphere, in the climate sphere, and in the social sphere. Thanks. Thank you, Simone. And thank you, all of you, uh, the panel panelists, uh, for your comments. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time, so uh, it is time to conclude our first uh, cycle of uh, discussions. Uh, yeah, there, there, there were excellent uh, comments, and uh, they simply showed us that even in the darkest of times, there is room for limited, reasonable, uh, pragmatic optimism, and uh, this is good for all of us. Um, this, 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 is, was, this was the, the first of a series of uh, conferences, so I'm not sure if the organizers want to add something. If not, uh, I'm just uh, thanking all the, the audience for the quality of their uh, uh, questions and uh, also the panelists for the quality of their answers. And um, long live the, this uh, Pour le Brésil conference. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you.